Rocky Point, Long Island, 1933. Guglielmo Marconi and David Sarnoff visit the birthplace of broadcasting. Radio's first castle was this rustic shack. In 1921, radio fans... Christmas Eve, 1906, Canadian engineer Reginald Fazenden gave the first voice broadcast in Brant Roque, Massachusetts. In the beginning, radio was a wild west. Amateurs in the early 19th century were most notable for their interference with ship signals and Navy rescues out on sea. In fact, many credit the interference of radio amateurs for the reason rescue efforts for the Titanic were so delayed. To reduce the chaos of radio amateurs, in 1912, Congress passed a radio act that restricted amateurs to operate on a limited airwave. This was when licensing was first implemented for radio. Yet during this time, anyone who wanted a license generally got it, a concept that would drastically change in years to come. The first radio commercial broadcast was on station KDKA in Pittsburgh in 1920. After hearing of the success of amateur Dr. Frank Conrad's broadcast from his garage, where he would play old recordings, Westinghouse decided to give him a show. And so, the first radio station was born. Within years of Frank Conrad's first broadcast, a proliferation of diverse voices took to the air. By 1923, there were 510 radio stations, including small businesses, churches, nonprofit groups, and community organizations, proving that the new media form could play a crucial role in the democratic process. But as scholar Stephen Lippmann notes, that didn't last long. By 1930, however, only 10 years after the first radio broadcast occurred, the industry was dominated by large commercial stations that sold advertising time in a variety of forms and were operated to generate profit. Many of the stations founded by nonprofit organizations were no longer in existence, and the form of diversity that characterized broadcasting's earliest years was gone. By 1927, a new radio act was implemented that transferred responsibility for the new medium to the Federal Radio Commission, which later became the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, in the 1934 Overarching Communications Act. With these congressional acts in place, the airwaves were more regulated and licensing more selective than they had ever previously been in the last three decades. At first, corporate control over the radio was mild. Pre-1980, a media company could not own more than 7 AM or FM stations. However, during the 1980s and the Reagan administration, this changed. Deregulation of media ownership laws were widespread and unprecedented. The spirit of this deregulation period was eventually embodied in the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which completely unregulated radio ownership in the United States. During this time, media companies became monopolies. In contrast to the earlier period of radio, in the last couple decades of the 20th century, sound had become homogenous, advertisers ruled the air, and voices that spoke up against the mainstream were completely ignored. And so the explosion of micro-powered radio stations began. The lowest wattage a station can have in order to qualify for a low-power FM license is 100 watts, where the startup cost would be around $50,000. However, most mainstream radio stations are 100,000 watts. Pioneer to the field of micropower radio, Mabana Kentako runs a one-watt station, in which the equipment he uses costs less than $600. Mabana, an African-American citizen, had been blinded by a police beating earlier in life. He set up his micropower radio station, Black Liberation Radio, in order to provide a voice to the African-American community of Springfield, Illinois. His station interviews black intellectuals and reads from black history and cultural struggles. But what Mabana's station is most known for is the pressure it puts on the local police. Mabana is notorious for exposing police corruption and for acting as the voice of civil rights in times of serious injustice. After the beating of Rodney King, who suffered 11 skull fractures, permanent brain damage, broken bones and teeth, and kidney damage from police brutality, Mabana was on the air reporting on the riots that followed and gathering support. It's the federal government. Hey, everybody, the government's here to get our equipment. U.S. Marshals, okay? What do you want? Right? Okay. 
You with Vanna? Yep. Open the door for right here for a second. I want to talk to you. What do you want to talk to me about? I'm going to serve you an order here. Okay. And what we're going to do is it'd be seizing all your uh, radio equipment. Okay. What all so, that include? Well, it'll say in the order. Although Mabana has been reported to the FCC for illegal broadcasting, his show continues. As a micropowered radio show host, he understands the importance of being the voice of his local community, a voice that mainstream has long forgotten. Says Mavana, this is a group of people that society has no need for, and instead of laying down and dying, they said, let's arm ourselves with the necessary knowledge and we'll make a place for ourselves. If those in charge of the money won't include us, then we'll include ourselves. Although Mabana's station only reaches about three or four square miles, his influence travels much further than that. All the way in Berkeley, California, Mabana was influencing another profound era of micropowered radio broadcasting. Stephen Dunifer cites Mabana's movement as just another push to motivate him to do what he had known he should do for a while, take back the airwaves. On April 11, 1993, Denifer made his first radio broadcast for Free Radio Berkeley. This radio station was the voice for the Berkeley and Oakland area in San Francisco region. According to Denifer, Free Radio Berkeley was created for two reasons. To express the right of the individual and the community to broadcast, and to provide them with the skill set to do so. Dunifer didn't see his radio station as pirate radio, as the FCC would label it. Piracy, he said, would imply that the people were taking something that didn't belong to them. But the airwaves are the people's, he argues. The free radio movement is a civil disobedience movement to challenge what he saw as the unconstitutional regulation of licensing. Joining us now in our San Francisco bureau is pirate radio station operator for Radio Free Berkeley, Stephen Dunifer. Mr. Dunifer recently won a victory against the FCC when a federal judge refused an injunction by the commission to shut down his pirate radio station. And in Boston, we're joined by the vice president for the Talk America Radio Network, Tom Starr. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Stephen Dunifer, let me go to you first. Why is it so important to operate your station in defiance of the FCC? It's important because it's a First Amendment issue that we're fighting here. The FCC has created such high barriers of entry that only the rich and well-endowed can have a voice in this country now. And what we're seeking to do is establish some alternative to that that would allow every community to have its own voice through inexpensive, uh, low-cost, uh, low-power FM stations that can easily be put together and can meet all the basic technical requirements mandated by the FCC. Now, Tom Starr, what's wrong with what Mr. Dunifer is doing? Well, first of all, I dispute that mis what was going on in the country is that well, I cannot buy a radio station if uh, you're not part of the rich and famous, because I know many radio station owners that have radio stations and don't have a lot of money were able to go to a bank and borrow the money and be able to put on a facility uh, not maybe as elaborate as some of the other major t radio stations, but more importantly, what we have to be concerned about is who's going to take care of making sure that signals don't get blocked by those radio stations that are legal. And I think also we have to make sure that we don't have radio stations being taken over by people who uh, are going to hurt us as free Americans. In fact, in 1995, the FCC took Jennifer to court, but the judge ruled that there were constitutional issues with the FCC's licensing and Free Radio Berkeley was under court protection. With this as precedent, free movement and micro radio startups increased dramatically. Although Free Radio Berkeley did end up getting silenced by the FCC in 1998, it provided and continues to provide a crucial role for the micro radio movement. Free Radio Berkeley gives workshops for people interested in learning how to set up low-power radio stations. They give transistor kits and technical training to anyone involved in national and international outreach efforts. Denifer helps supply the Zapatistas in Mexico with transmitters and the technical know-how for using a low-powered radio. And in 1994, the Zapatista movement rose to challenge Mexico's dominant PRI party. Free Radio Berkeley also aided Haitian liberation groups. 
The airwaves, says Stonifer, belong to the people. They're a common resource that belongs to everyone and should not be used for the exclusive profit by corporations. Because of Dunifer's movement and the court ruling that held back so many micro-radio stations, pressure was put on the FCC to provide more licensing to low-powered radio stations. Originally, hundreds or thousands of licenses were supposed to be approved for low-powered FM stations, or LPFM. But after lobbying from the National Association of Broadcasters and National Public Radio, the LPFM legislation resulted in a pathetic version of its once monumental form. And in the end, only dozens of licenses were actually given to LPFM stations. But regardless of FCC regulations, people like Mabana and Dunifer will find a way to send their message and spread their cause. They are the people who know the system is unjust and will circumvent it for the good of their community and the good of the public.